put this back on. Okay. Yeah. So welcome once again. Oh, I didn't turn on. Okay. Now, uh, welcome once again, everybody, to the um, online uh, SPICE and SPIN Plus X seminar workshops. Um, this is, as you know, uh, for the collaboration between the SPIN Phenomenon and the Disciplinary Center and the SPIN Plus X, a collaborative research center uh, between Mainz and Kaisos Latin, uh, led by Martin Ashleem and uh, Borka Hillebrands and uh, Matthias Chloe, uh, and SPICE led by myself, uh, Harris Inova, and Karen Eversoshita. Uh, we have, uh, as you know, the Zoom web seminar at high style, uh, meaning that please write your questions in the Q and A, and um, then uh, after the talk is over, uh, the, the, uh, the chairperson, which will be Karen today, uh, will give you the floor uh, to ask questions to Karen directly. Uh, and uh, once again, please watch the, the schedule. We have uh, next week uh, Thomas Dito about uh, discussing electronic field effects and localized spins, and then we'll update later on the schedule uh, one or more two talks that we have before the break of the, of the winter. Um, we go to, the, uh, let me just say a few words about uh, Gary Donnelly. Uh, this is now at Cambridge in Cavendish Laboratories. Uh, it's a rising star in our field. Uh, and I hear very good things about her uh, speaking ability, so she's going to a fantastic talk and uh, she has done a fantastic work in dynamics of three-dimensional magnetic structures uh, in, recent, uh, in recent times, uh, particularly during this time in COVID, even during COVID time, uh, she's been very, very busy, very well, to isolation, she's been isolated with her experiments and uh, has had uh, as a recent award uh, in the Young Career, the European Magnetic Research Association Young Scientist Award. Uh, so that's all I'm going to say. I'm going to give you immediately the floor to you. So please, uh, uh, Clary, go ahead and uh, share your screen with us. Uh, Thanks. Uh, Thanks, Jairo. Can, can you see my yeah. screen now? Yeah, we're going to hear. Perfect. Okay, perfect. So shall I go ahead? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So um, thank you very much for the introduction and also for the opportunity to speak to everyone today um, on these online seminars. Also to you, all, all of the organizers for organizing them. They've been a really you know, great weekly thing to look forward to, to keep in touch with what's going on during this very unusual year. So I'm going to speak to you today about our work on three-dimensional magnetic systems. Before I start, um, I'd like to just draw your attention to the um, three affiliations that you can see at the top of the screen. So I'm currently at the University of Cambridge, but I've got the PSI and the ETH Zurich up as well, um, because part of the work I'm going to show to you today was done during my time um, in Switzerland. So before I get into why 3D magnetic systems are interesting, I'd like to start with possibly the most important part of the talk, which is a massive thank you to all of the people that I've had the privilege to work with over um, the last few years. So starting with my current group, which is led by Amalio Fernandez Pacheco, who's now at the University of Glasgow, but his group is split between the University of Cambridge and the University of Glasgow. So Cambridge is where I am at the moment. And the group of Dieter Seuss at the University of Vienna with Klaus Albert, Konstantin Metlov in Donetsk, and as well in Switzerland, the group of Laura Heidemann, my PhD supervisor at the PSI and ETH Zurich. And of course, um, my colleagues at the Swiss Light Source who have been really it's been a great privilege to work with them to develop some of the methods that I'll present to you today. So three-dimensional magnetic systems, or 3D nanomagnetism. I thought I'd start, first start with nanomagnetism in general. And if we think about what we've learned and what we've done over and what the community has been able to do over the last few years, last few decades really, there's been a huge amount of you know, great physics that's been found out and new functionalities that have been discovered. However, if we think, let's say, about the different types of systems that have been studied, the vast majority have actually been performed for two-dimensional magnetic systems, be that magnetic thin films or patterned uh, magnetic man nanostructures. Now, when we think about going to the third dimension, you can see immediately from the schematic that there's a huge number of new geometries to become av av available to us. And there's actually a, new, a huge number of new functionalities in physics that also become um, available when it comes to the magnetic properties of 3D systems. Now I'm going to first of all start with perhaps the most well-known example of a 3D magnetic architecture, and that is the racetrack memory proposed by Stuart Parkin back in 2008. It is an example of where we can use so it's a 3D architecture of magnetic nanowires where we use um, three 
let's say the three dimensionality allows for a very high density data storage. But it's not only the, let's say the density of a 3D structure that um, can prov provide advantages or interesting physics. When we consider these 3D, let's say cylindrical nanowires that would make up the racetrack memory, and likewise magnetic nanotubes, they have been predicted to exhibit very promising domain wall dynamics, be it magne including magnetochirality effects or um, ultra fast domain wall velocities, as well as access to regimes such as the magnonic regime, where there has been predictions of, let's say, let's say the, the spin Cherenkov effect to name you know, one such example. And in the last couple of years, there's been uh, some first demonstrations of, like experimentally, of these domain wall dynamics, where very high domain wall mobilities have been observed in cylindrical structures. This is by the group of Olivier Fruhart, showing that there's a real promise when we go to 3D nanowire um, architectures. So it's not only um, nanowires that are interesting in 3D. There's also, for the case of frustrated magnetic systems, such as artificial spin ice, when we lift one sublattice up into the third dimension compared to the other, so out of the plane, there's the possibility to, uh, to achieve extensive degeneracy and the true Coulomb phase, really approaching the physics of a, let's say, the original pyrochlor spin ice systems. Now, 3D or three-dimensionality also plays an important role when it comes to topological systems or topological structures. And perhaps the most well-known example of a topological structure these days is the magnetic skirmion, which you can see in this, um, in this schematic here. Now, in, in a magnetic thin film, this magnetic skirmion could almost be thought of as a 2D structure. However, when we go into larger bulk-like systems, the skirmions become skirmion tubes and there's even the possibility for topological transformations within the bulk that can include singularities of the magnetization. Lastly, or the last example that I'm going to give to you today is one of the holy grails of 3D nanomagnetism at the moment, and that is the magnetic hopfion. So hopfions are essentially a three-dimensional topological structure, the 3D, let's say, equivalent of a skirmion. And um, they've been observed in a number of different systems, such as anisotropic fluids and liquid crystals. However, ferromagnetic hopfions have only in the last few years become, let's say, a real interest in the community. And this is because there's been a few, uh, like a growing number of theoretical predictions that they could be stable in certain ferromagnetic systems. So, of course, there's a growing interest and a growing drive in the field to find these structures experimentally to understand them and also hopefully one day be able to control them and use them for some sort of device. So what I've hopefully been able to sort of show you with this slide is that there's a huge amount to be excited about when we go to three-dimensional magnetic systems. However, to study them experimentally, we need new experimental methods. And in order to know what methods we need, we need to think more carefully about what kind of systems we're specifically gonna be looking at. And I like to think of 3D magnetic systems in two main regimes. And this is kind of reflected in what I'm going to be talking to you about today. First of all, in the bulk. So what do we mean by the bulk? Well, by bulk, I mean systems which are large enough where the internal magnetic configuration is not dominated by the shape anisotropy, for example. So this can be structures on the order of hundreds of nanometers, micrometers, or even larger. And in these bulk-like systems where the magnetization is relatively free, we can look for new 3D magnetic configurations with new types of magnetic structures. And of course, look at their dynamical behavior, so how they respond to excitations. And in order to achieve these observations, we need to develop new 3D imaging techniques, which is what we've been doing the last few years. Now, the second regime is kind of, let's say, the opposite extreme. So as opposed to the bulk, where we're looking at magnetic structures almost in their natural environment, in patterned 3D structures, we purposefully confine the magnetization by patterning magnetic materials on the nanoscale. And therefore, we're able to control or tailor the magnetic properties. Now, in 3D, this gives us a number of possibilities for new properties. For example, by introducing new geometric effects such as magnetochirality, as well as taking a first step towards 3D spintronic devices. And now again, in order to realize these systems, we need new types of methods. And the method in particular that we would really need are new, essentially 3D printing techniques to realize 3D magnetic nanostructures. 
So first of all, I'm going to start with our bulk systems and specifically the development of 3D imaging techniques. So when we think about imaging of 3D magnetic systems, um, there are a number of probes that we can consider using. First of all, electrons, so electron microscopy. Secondly, neutrons. And thirdly, x-rays, to name a few. And in order to determine or to choose which one we want to use for our um, experiments to look at our particular samples, we need to consider two things. We first of all need to consider the spatial resolution. So what is the smallest structure that we can resolve with these techniques? Secondly, we need to um, consider what is the thickest sample that we can look at. So how deep within a material can we penetrate? And if we compare these different probes with electrons, we have very high spatial resolution. So that's perfect for the study of topological magnetic structures. However, we are limited in sa to sample thicknesses of about you know, a few hundred nanometers. Now neutrons, we have the opposite extreme. We have lower spatial resolution, but we, we can look at much, much thicker samples. And with X-rays, we kind of combine the best of both worlds. So we're able to retain this high spatial resolution on the order of tens of nanometers. Um, that we have with electrons, but by going to higher energy x-rays, we're able to probe samples that are much thicker, up to tens of micrometers in diameter. And it's for this reason that we choose to use x-rays um, for our experimental, um, let's see, investigations. So before I go into too many details about or go on to the next step of our results, I'd like to first of all introduce the concept of x-ray magnetic imaging of three-dimensional magnetic systems. And first of all, I'd like to introduce the concept of tomography. So here we're talking first of all about non-magnetic tomography, where the idea is that we have a, some sort of 3D structure. We measure two dimensional projections of this structure with high resolution for many different sample orientations with respect to the X-ray beam, as you can see here. And then we re recover the internal magnetic or the internal configuration by using a reconstruction algorithm. And this is very similar to what happens in a CT scan in the hospital. Now, when we want to go to magnetic tomography, there are a number of basic ingredients that we need. First of all, we need the 2D projections. And as we're working in the hard X-ray regime now to look at our thicker samples, we're using, a, we actually have to overcome some very weak magnetic signals. So the signals that we're probing, is the X-ray magnetic circular dichroism, in the hard X-ray regime, they are much weaker than in lower energy, than with lower energy X-rays. In order to overcome these weak signals, we turn to highly sensitive techniques known as coherent diffractive imaging techniques, such as tychography, and use these to probe the, let's say, these weak magnetic signals with high spatial resolution. So to give an example of how this works with XMCD, we probe our sample with circular right and circular left, and we can take the difference between these two images to isolate the magnetic contrast with high resolution. And here's an example of some iron gadolinium uh, worm domains that we looked at. So we have our first, let's say, piece of the puzzle. The next question is, what kind of combination of these 2D images do we need to, to measure in order to, let's say, probe all three components of the magnetization? And it soon became apparent that a single rotation axis, which is commonly used for, um, let's say, standard non-magnetic tomography, was not going to be sufficient. With that, you would only probe two, two components of the magnetization. In contrast, what we did here was, this is at the CSAC beamline at the Swiss Light Source, we um, measure an entire tomographic data set around one tomographic axis. We then tilt the sample at 30 degrees and we measure a second tomographic um, data set. And these two data sets combined give us access to all three components of the magnetization. Now the third and as a last piece of the puzzle is combining all of this data to recover our magnetization vector field. And for this we developed a new reconstruction algorithm in-house which is basically based on the um, analytical formulation of the X-ray interaction with the magnetization of course, as a function of angle and orientation, and we based this on a gradient-based iterative um, reconstruction algorithm. And I'll go into a little bit more detail about this later in my talk. So now that we are armed with all of the basic ingredients for magnetic tomography, we can go on to our first demonstration. And that is uh, looking at a gadolinium cobalt pillar, which was cut from a nugget with a focused ion beam. So you can see the pillar here in this scanning electron microscope. And the, what we need to note, first of all, is it's five micrometers in diameter. What this means is that the internal magnetic configuration, we didn't know beforehand. So there was no other way for us to actually see 
inside the magnetic material and to probe this magnetic configuration. And so what we first of all do is we go to two-dimensional magnetic imaging. We measure these um, XMCD images, so first with single polarization and then taking the difference between the two at the gadolinium L3 edge, because this pro provides us with the strongest XMCD signal in these higher energy X-rays. And we can see with this single polarization image, it's very much dominated by the electronic contrast. This makes sense because the magnetic contrast is very weak. But when we take the difference between the two circular polarizations, we see a quite um, clear bright and dark patches in, within the magnetic pillar. Now these correspond to the magnetization pointing in and out of the plane. And uh, it tells us a couple of things. First of all, our sample is magnetic, which is great. Secondly, we have seem to have quite a complicated internal magnetic configuration. However, with this single projection, we can't really see what exactly is going on. So we measure over 1000 of such projections around many different orientations um, with respect to the X-rays and use our reconstruction algorithm to reconstruct the internal configuration with 100 nanometers spatial resolution. And you can see this in this uh, video here. I want to emphasize that this is a static configuration. We're just showing it in a relatively dynamic way. But what we can note is that the magnetization appears to be quite smoothly varying. Now this makes sense. It corresponds to what we expect from our um, knowledge of gadolinium cobalt. But there's also a number of twists and turns in the magnetization, which are quite intriguing. So in order to take a closer look, we first of all look at a two-dimensional slice of the magnetization. And in this slice, we, we take a closer look by plotting the in-plane components with these streamlines. And the out-of-plane component is indicated by the color. So purple and orange represent in and out of the plane. Now, when we see this configuration, we can notice a few quite striking facts. We have topological objects such as vortices where the magnetization curls around a central point. And in this point, the magnetization can point in or out of the plane. We also have anti-vortices where it's a more saddle-like structure, um, again, with a core that can point in and out of the plane. However, so this shows us that we've got a, quite a complex network of three of topological objects, but it's a very 2D way to look at a 3D data set. So we, what we next go on to do is look at a volume, a sub-volume of our structures, specifically this volume indicated that surrounds the central vortex of our pillar. Now, when we look at this in a bit more detail, we can notice a few different things. First of all, the color that indicates the vertical component of the magnetization. On the left-hand side, the magnetization generally points up. On the right-hand side, it generally points down. And in between, we have this white surface, which corresponds to the magnetic domain wall. Now, what is um, really interesting is that Within this subvolume, our vortex core, indicated by this isosurface, actually crosses the domain wall at, uh, at two points, here and here. And when it crosses the domain wall, the polarization, so the direction of the core, changes, indicating a change in the topology. Now, what happens when we have a change in the topology? Well, we actually expect the presence of singularities of the magnetization, which are also known as block points, were first predicted back in the 1960s by Feldkiller. Um, but had not been, let's say, directly observed up until this point. Now, what we can do is we can plot the magnetization in the vicinity of these crossing points, and we see a magnetic configuration that looks very similar to that which is theoretically predicted for these types of structures. We see a circulating block point at the top crossing point, with the magnetization circulating in the plane, and it pointing up and down, above and below. And at the other point, we have a more twisted state, which we believe is a, an anti-block point. So it's just as we have a vortex and an anti-vortex, here we have a block point and an anti-block point, which we believe are likely to have formed as a pair within the bulk of our structure. So this is a really nice sort of demonstration of the new insights that we can get with these 3D imaging techniques. However, you might be thinking, well, how much can we actually trust these reconstructions? There's kind of a black box for those of us who haven't been directly involved in the development of the algorithm. And of course, we were thinking this too, we wanted to make absolute sure that we could be confident in these results. So we performed simulations of our uh, magnetic tomography process, specifically using a micromagnetic simulation that was calculated by Sebastian Gliga at the Paul Scherer Institute. So this micromagnetic simulation was particularly useful because it contained a number of very similar structures to what we observed in our experiments. We saw vortices, block points, and anti-block points. 
And essentially what we did was we measured or we simulated uh, the projections of, the, of this micromagnetic state for many different sample orientations. We fed this into our reconstruction algorithm and we could directly compare our magnetic reconstruction with the original structure. And in this way, we saw a very good agreement between our reconstruction of these different structures and in general had a very accurate overall magnetic um, let's say reconstruction, giving us added confidence that we could believe, really believe these um, exciting results. So you may think we are now at the point where we can perform magnetic tomography and the hard work is done, but I'm afraid that's not quite the end of the story. We still have a major challenge facing us for now that we have access to these large data sets. One of the main challenges is how do we analyze, how do we pick through the millions of pixels and actually analyze and identify relevant and interesting magnetic figurations. And uh, in order to address this challenge, we have um, recently implemented a new type of data analysis for these 3D configurations, which implements a calculation of the magnetic vorticity vector. Now I've put this um, equation up here on the slide for those of you who are interested, but essentially what the magnetic vorticity vector is, it represents the flux of the skirmion number density, meaning that it encodes the topology of our magnetic configuration. So we can first of all consider a couple of basic topological structures. When we think about vortices, we see that the vorticity vector aligns parallel to the core of our vortices. For anti-vortices, the vorticity vector aligns anti-parallel representing or reflecting the opposite topological charge of a vortex and an anti-vortex. And indeed, we then have, so we then have this feeling or this understanding that the vorticity vector is, again, the flux of the skirmion number density and directly related to the topology of our magnetic configuration. So we can use this to actually identify topological features within our data set. And indeed, we do this by plotting regions of high vorticity within our pillar. You can see immediately that uh, we have a sort of network of tubes which correspond to the cores of vortices and anti-vortices within our structure. But we can actually go further than this. We can also look for abrupt changes in the magnetic vorticity, which represent abrupt changes in the topology and therefore the presence of block points by plotting the divergence, so regions of high divergence of the vorticity vector. And I think this is a really nice demonstration of, let's say, how powerful this new type of data processing is. So here with this simple calculation, we see over 50 block points popping up, let's say, out of the data set. Whereas if you remember back to our previous analysis, we were looking at a sub volume, we were looking at the crossover points of a vortex core and a domain wall. And in that way, we were able to identify two different block points within our structure. So this is a really, let's say, useful and, um, powerful technique for the data, for the analysis of such configurations. But it's not just for the location and uh, let's see, identification of um, magnetic structures or topolog topological magnetic structures that the vorticity vector is useful. It can also help us to interpret certain um, relatively intriguing magnetic configurations. And one such magnetic configuration is um, this, let's say loop, which represents which is made up of a vortex and an anti-vortex core, as you can see in this cross section here. So this look was particularly interesting because let's say it's a sort of confined structure with a diameter of about 400 nanometers. So it's a really a three-dimensional structure that appears to occur naturally within the bulk of our magnetic systems. However, it wasn't until we plotted the magnetic vorticity vector that we could really see what was going on. Specifically, we, when we plot the vorticity vector, we see that the vorticity is circulating around this loop, meaning that these are magnetic vortex rings. So magnetic vortex rings were first predicted back in the 90s by Papa Nicolau and Nigel Cooper, who is one of the co-authors of this work, and, um, but they have not yet been observed directly again. Now, there's another particularly intriguing fact about these vortex rings was that analogous to their hydrodynamic equivalent, they were predicted to be dynamical objects. So they were not predicted to be, um, let's say, stable, but they were static. And of course, these in this um, sample in our, in our pillar, we have a measurement that takes at least 50 hours. So we definitely have these samples. So we have this intriguing stability, essentially, of these magnetic vortex rings. Now, the question was, why, why are they so stable? And the first thing that we turned to was, 
topology. Could it be that we have some topologically non-trivial structure that is resulting in the stability of, our, um, of these objects? In order to probe or to plot or to determine the topology of our vortex ring, we took inspiration from the, um, our colleagues working with magnetic hopfions, by plotting pre-images in three dimensions. And this is an example of a, of a, a well-known piece of literature on magnetic hopfions from Paul Sutcliffe. Now, what these tubes mean, we are plotting pre-images here. We have two tubes, a blue one and a red one. Now, the, in the blue isosurface, it represents a region where the magnetization is pointing in the Z direction. In the red isosurface, or the red tube, it represents a region where the magnetization is pointing in, an, in another direction. And by seeing that these tubes actually interlink a number of times, we see that they have a non-zero Hopf index, and then therefore this structure would be a Hopfian. So we can then go on to plot the pre-images for our own data. Now, almost unfortunately, we see that our pre-images do not link. So this is not a Hopfian, and it has a Hopf index of zero. However, this is even more intriguing. We have this 3D structure that shouldn't be stable, but it actually is. So we go on to look further into our data to see whether there could be more of these structures um, around. And indeed, we identify a number of these vortex rings, each that have this circulating vorticity vector. And by a combination of looking at the size and the surroundings of these different vortex rings and performing modeling of bulk textures such as cross tie walls, which was done by our colleague um, Constantine Medlov, we actually are able to determine that the key to the stability of these vortex rings is the magnetostatics. Now, this is particularly important because when we think about three-dimensional structures and often their analytical modeling, magnetostatics are not always taken into consideration because, I mean, understandably, they're very hard to calculate analytically. Now, these observations indicate that the magnetostatics seem to be more important than we perhaps realized and something that could be really important for future studies on, let's say, topological and non-topological structures in 3D. So hopefully what you've seen so far from our work on magnetic tomography and these new types of data analysis is that it can really lead to new insights into um, three-dimensional magnetic systems. But in terms of the imaging techniques, we didn't want to stop there. So we identified a number of different routes along which we wanted to go to advance our experimental capabilities. And in particular, this involved going to more flexible experimental geometries, going to the fourth dimension, so being able to visualize the dynamics of magnetic systems in 3D, and finally going to higher spatial resolutions, being able to probe smaller textures of the magnetization. So first of all, more flexible experimental geometries. So your question may be, why is this necessary? Why is tomography not a one size fits all technique? And the answer is um, quite simple actually. So tomography, I must emphasize, is a technique where the rotation axis is perpendicular to the X-rays or, or to your probe. Now this is particularly um, let's say advantageous for cylindrical samples where um, such as, let's say, the pillar that we saw in our first measurement. However, when we go to flat extended samples such as a silicon nitride membrane that we often use in X-ray measurements, when we rotate our sample up at a certain angle, we will actually block the X-ray beam, we'll lose angular information and we can introduce artifacts into our reconstruction. Now a technique or a geometry that actually gets around this um, challenge is laminography. So now laminography, as opposed to tomography, our rotation axis is actually not perpendicular to the x-rays, but it's tilted towards them, meaning that for flat extended samples, we don't block the beam at any particular angle. So before we could go on to an experimental demonstration of the laminography, we first needed to upgrade our reconstruction algorithm, which previously had assumed a tomographic geometry. And we do this by combining all of the different projections that we measure in a single step to reconstruct the 3D configuration. And um, at the same time, we actually are able to improve the reconstruction itself dramatically. So we see that um, we have a very good reconstruction uh, quality there. And if anyone's interested in this reconstruction algorithm or in finding out more, I want to mention that it's available online, but of course you're more than uh, welcome to get in touch if you want to make use of it. Secondly, we needed a high resolution experimental setup. 
And for that, we went to the CSACS beam line at the Swiss Light Source, where they were developing a high resolution laminography setup. And what I'm showing you here is a first demonstration of non magnetic laminography at their beam line, where you can see they're able, they're measuring the nano structure of an integrated circuit with very, very high spatial resolution. Now, this high stabil stability and high resolution setup was perfect for, to allow us to go on to do our first demonstration of magnetic laminography. So one last uh, point about this technique before we get into the results, and that is that it actually has another advantage in that with one single rotation axis, we're able to probe all three components of the magnetization. Now, um, what this means is that our, our measurement actually becomes so much simpler. We can measure all of the information that we need with a single rotation axis and therefore don't need to be changing different sample um, setups and everything halfway through the measurement. So now onto our demonstration. And the sample that we looked at um, in this case was a 1.2 micrometer thick gadolinium cobalt film um, on a membrane that we milled a disc into. And I just want to mention that this film has a varying magnetic anisotropy. So when we look at these 2D images, first of all, we see, um, great again, the sample is magnetic. So we have these bright and dark regions corresponding to different directions of the magnetization. But we also see that the magnetization seems to be changing across the thickness of the sample. But of course, to see what's going on in 3D, we need to perform 3D imaging. And so we measure 144 of these, of these projections around 360 degrees and use our newly uh, upgraded reconstruction algorithm to reconstruct the internal magnetic configuration of our sample. So we see a smooth transition between a single um, domain at the top, a single uniform domain at the top of our structure to a double vortex state at the bottom, indicative of this change in magnetic anisotropy. And this is a really nice example of the, let's see, what we can do with laminography. And indeed with our simulations, we see that laminography works incredibly well for 3D magnetic imaging. And it actually has another advantage or yet another advantage. And that is when we think about our, our wish to go to the fourth dimension. Now, for now that we can look at flat extended samples, what we can actually do is pattern our samples lithographically, meaning that we can pattern strip lines onto our sample with which we can excite our magnetization. And that's what we do here. We pattern our strip line, we use the Ersted field of our strip line to excite the magnetic state of our disk. And by, let's say, frequency and phase matching the excitation, so this AC current, to the time structure of our X-rays, we can perform a pump probe measurement, measuring a laminography data set for many different time delays with respect to the, 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 the main time structure. And with this four dimensional information, we can directly look at the dynamics in 3D. So what we can first of all do is go to our vortices in the bottom of our disk. And um, what I'm showing you here is a difference image where this purple line is our vortex, the core of our vortex domain wall. And it's oscillating, as you can see, around this white reference line. We can track the position of our vortex core with high um, accuracy and determine actually that it's moving at approximately 200 meters per second over the two nanosecond period of the excitation, demonstrating essentially that we can track topological structures buried within the bulk of a system with high accuracy. But that's not all we can do with this new technique. We can also perform Fourier analysis of our four dimensional data and therefore identify modes of coherent rotation modes of the magnetization within the bulk of our structure. And here, what um, we're showing you here is um, these such modes. So the red structures in this um, 3D image correspond to regions where the magnetization is pressing at a high amplitude. Now we see that the magnetization precession is directly related or seems to be very closely related to the 3D magnetic structure, again, providing more insight into the dynamics of these bulk 3D systems. And we were very happy to have this work featured on the cover of Nature Nano earlier this year. So now that we've ticked off the first two uh, points on our list, the last um, route that we wanted to go down to improve our experimental capabilities was going to higher spatial resolutions. And what I want to emphasize here when we're talking about these weak magnetic signals is that going to smaller length scales essentially is related to achieving a higher signal to noise ratio of our, um, of our data set. 
And there's two ways in which we can improve our signal to noise ratio. First of all, we can go to higher coherent flux, so synchrotrons with higher coherent flux. And this is actually a really exciting time for synchrotron radiation. We've got upgrades of our third generation synchrotrons, such as the ESRF, the SLS and Diamond, either in progress or coming online in the next few years or currently in planning as it is. And we've also got the next generation of synchrotrons, the fourth generation, that have recently come online. So MAX4 in Sweden and um, Sirius in Brazil. Now, what these new generations or these upgraded synchrotrons will provide us with is orders of magnitude more coherent flux, meaning that um, we can actually push the length scales of our measurements down to much, much smaller length scales, allowing us to look at smaller details of the magnetization. So this will be a really great, uh, let's see, an exciting future, a bright future um, for 3D magnetic imaging. But perhaps a more immediately available route to higher signal to noise ratio is going to stronger signals in the first place. And for that, we can go to lower energy X-rays, so soft X-rays, where we have a much stronger X-ray magnetic circular dichroism. Although we're limited to, let's say, thinner samples, so a few hundred nanometers of material, we can have XMCD signals of up to 100% of the absorption. And for this reason, we uh, kind of choose uh, to, let's say, make use of these stronger signals by implementing magnetic laminography at the Pollux beam ring at the Swiss light source. So um, if we look, first of all, at the laminography stage, and this was implemented by Kat Katerina Vitti, who's a postdoc at the Beamline. You can see when we're dealing with soft x-rays, everything's in, um, in a vacuum and with the optics, everything's quite tight. But they've done a really good job of implementing this rotation stage for laminography, um, meaning that we can perform this first demonstration of magnetic laminography. And the sample that we look at is a target squirming on structure that was fabricated as a permalloy disc fabricated by Simona Finizio at the Pollux beam ring. And with this, um, with magnetic laminography, we're able to resolve the target squirming on structure with a spatial resolution of sub 50 nanometers, meaning that it's really opening the door to the probing of nanostructures and indeed three dimensional nanostructures with high spatial resolution. So speaking of three-dimensional nanostructures. This takes me on to the second part of my talk in which I'm going to focus on patterned 3D structures. So as opposed to what we've spoken about so far in the bulk where the magnetization has been relatively free to, or relatively free in these larger systems, in patterned magnetic nanostructures we are deliberately confining the magnetization. And in order to confine this, let's say, in specific ways, we need very key um, let's say, keep capabilities to pattern magnetic materials on the nanoscale in three dimensions. So what's been done so far? Well, there's been a couple of main ways in which 3D printing, essentially, of magnetic materials has been achieved. And the first is through the coating of non-magnetic three-dimensional scaffolds that can be realized with um, techniques such as two-photon lithography. And in this way, this has led to the realization of, for example, three-dimensional um, artificial spin ice lattices or geometrical structures such as this magnetic buckyball. Now, one of the main challenges here is the actual magnetic coating. So you can maybe note in this um, element-specific rendering of the buckyball here, where the cobalt is shown in orange and the polymer resist is shown in purple, that we, we can still see parts of the resist. And this indicates the significant shadowing effects that we actually get when we try to coat these 3D structures with traditional techniques such as sputtering or evaporation. And we've done quite a lot of work in the last few years to try and overcome these, um, let's say, limitations and achieve a more homogeneous deposition onto these scaffolds. And one way in which we've done this is through the development of electrolyst deposition. And this has been the work of Petai Pip at the EMPA in Switzerland, where you can see on a, let's say, in this case, slightly larger buckyball, with electrolyst deposition, he's been able to um, deposit very high quality permalloy onto the three dimensional structure with almost homogeneous, um, let's say, deposition. An alternative way where, which has led to more conformal um, coating of magnetic materials is a combination of atomic layer deposition and um, electro deposition that's also been developed at the, in, in Switzerland at the Paul Scherer Institute. Now, as well as um, shell like structures that can be um, fabricated in this way. We're also interested in the direct printing of magnetic materials to create kind of full magnetic um, structures. 
And this can be done with the technique called focused electron beam induced deposition. Now this technique is kind of the focus of the group that I'm currently in, so the group of Amalio Fernandez Pacheco, and this is what I'm going to be talking about in the rest of my talk. Here, um, or in the last few years, FEBIT has been shown really nicely to be able to lead to nanowire based uh, 3D architectures, as you can see here from these different um, papers, and also nanowire based, let's say, more, more uh, wavy or, or helical um, structures. However, one of the focuses or one of the questions of um, our group was, can we go beyond nanowire structures? Can we go to essentially arbitrary three-dimensional geometries? And this takes me to the work of Luca Skorich, who is a PhD student um, in Amalio's group, but currently at the University of Cambridge, where I am, who has been developing essentially 3D printing based on FEBIT. So before we go into details of Luca's work, we can first of all take a second to remind ourselves what FEBIT is. And essentially what FEBIT is, is we have a scanning electron microscope that has the ability to um, pattern, so um, implements uh, scanning beam patterns. And we inject a precursor into the chamber and we can locally deposit the material using a focused electron beam. Now, because we're using a focused electron beam, we can achieve depositions with very high spatial resolution in the order of tens of nanometers. And there's a number of different materials that can be um, deposited. Now, perhaps the most well-known ones are platinum and tungsten, which are relatively dirty. But um, what is very exciting for the magnetic community is that we can also deposit cobalt, actually with purities upwards of 95%. So now onto how Luca has combined FEBID with, a, let's say, a 3D printing methodology. So he's combined essentially CAD designs with a robust growth model of FEBID. And in this way, um, can achieve 3D printing technique. So essentially what we do is we take our CAD design, we slice it up as you would do normally in normal 3D printing. Now Luca then um, combines the growth model with calibration measurements that you also um, perform to, deter to develop or to determine a scanning set of scanning instructions for the microscope. You tell these to the microscope and in the end, you can obtain a very high spatial resolution three-dimensional structure that is very accurate um, or very similar to what the original CAD drawing was in the first place. So as you can imagine, these new 3D printing capabilities are incredibly exciting when it comes to um, 3D nanomagnetism, specifically because we can pattern it with this high um, purity cobalt. And um, what we went, went on to do is kind of to identify a few different areas which this might be particularly useful for as a first demonstration. And um, two main sort of examples are as follows. First of all, the introduction of curvature into a system or into a magnetic thin film. Now, it's been shown by theorists in the last few years, including Dennis Shekha, that the introduction of um, curvature actually leads to emergent magnetic properties, such as emergent magnetic anisotropies and magnetochirality effects. In addition, when we go to 3D, we also have the possibility to go to new topologies, such as our Mobius strip here. So taking inspiration from these two examples, Luca went on to, um, to let's say, fabricate these structures with cobalt febid, and in this um, way has been able to demonstrate really, let's see, nice examples of 3D magnetic nanostructures, ranging from these curved magnetic systems, which have both positive and negative curvature, to what may be, or what we believe may be one of the smallest Mobius strips, and definitely one of the smallest magnetic Mobius strips that has been realized to date. So with these new capabilities, this opens the door to a number of, let's say, roots for 3D nanomagnetism. And there's two, um, let's say, topics that I'm going to speak to you in the last uh, few minutes of my talk. First of all is um, the introduction of magnetochirality effects via the direct printing of chiral geometries. And this is the work of Dedalo Sanz Hernandez, who did his PhD with Amalio at the University of Cambridge. He's now at CNRS Palace. And what Dedalo has done is um, he has deposited these 3D double helix structures with their intrinsic chirality. Now, the second um, topic that I'm going to talk to you is the work of Fan Fan Meng, also at the University of Cambridge with Amalio, who has been working on prototyping 3D magnetic nanostructures to kind of make the first steps towards bringing spintronics to three dimensions, as you can see here with her cobalt nanobridge. So firstly, with magnetochirality. So when we think about chirality and the Jaloszynski-Maria interaction, 
we know, I mean, it's very well known for um, resulting in exotic magnetic configurations, such as skirmions, which we have um, talked about already previously in this talk, but also structures such as spin spirals. However, to realize this chirality, up until now, the vast majority of experiments have required specific materials or high quality materials and interfaces. But chirality can also be introduced in other ways. For example, via curvature where through the curvature of a magnetic thin film can lead to, here we see the twisting of a Landau pattern, or in three-dimensional nanowire structures or nanotube structures, we can have chiral domain wall motion. Now, what we are interested in here is actually going, let's say, to chirality, but in a more direct fashion via the printing of, or the 3D printing of chiral geometries on the nanoscale. And specifically, when we're talking about chiral geometries, what we're talking about is perhaps one of the most well-known chiral geometries, and that is a helix. In this case, we're looking at a double helix. We pattern these structures with the FEBID, and you can see here in this SEM image, so the colors are artificial, they're just to kind of um, guide the eye to show that we really have the intertwined, these intertwined double helix structure. Um, and what we first of all want to do is see what the magnetic configuration of this structure is. So we go to um, our X-ray magnetic circular dichroism again, and this time we're going to the Mistral beam line at the ALBA synchrotron, where when we look at our XMCD images, we see a quite, um, let's say, clear signal or, or pattern in our XMCD structure. We see red, then blue, then red, then blue, so this alternating contrast along the long axis of the helix, and when we think about this in a bit more detail, when we compare it to macromagnetic simulations, we see that this actually um, corresponds to the anti-parallel alignment of the helices. Now this makes sense, I mean, I think we, we think it makes sense, because if we think about how the helices are grown, they're grown in parallel, and when they are still very small, we believe that they will be able to um, reorient themselves in order to minimize their magnetostatic energy, and therefore align anti-parallel. And this anti-parallel alignment is therefore retained as it grows um, up along the length of the nanostructure. Now, it's not just the anti-parallel alignment of these, um, of these stru structures, which is um, particularly interesting, but we also need to consider the fact that these double helices are actually overlapping in the middle. Now, with simulations, what we realize is that in between, let's say, this, um, this up domain, so this up helix shown in white, and the opposite direction of helix, which is shown in black, we have a magnetic domain wall, which turns out to be a helical block domain wall. So we are able, through the patterning of a chiral geometry, to induce a chiral spin texture in the center. So, but it's not just, uh, let's say, the formation of spin textures, chiral spin textures, um, that this new 3D printing technique gives us access to. We also, if you think, of your, if you look more closely at this SEM image, you may have noticed that there's something else going on. We actually are able to grow two chiralities within the same structure. So in the bottom half of our helix, we have a left-handed chirality. In the top, hand, uh, the top half, we have a right-handed chirality. And in between, we have this threshold, this region where the two chiralities meet. And this is, I think, a really massive advantage of these 3D printing techniques that we can really tailor and control the chirality spatially within our structure. So um, with this uh, meeting or this threshold of the um, chir chiral regions, this may is slightly reminiscent of what we quite often see in nature, which is known as a tendril perversion where different regions of um, different chirality can meet at a certain point. And it may also remind you of, let's say, old telephone wires, um, which all often had these defects. Now, the question that we want to ask is, what happens at this threshold from a magnetic point of view? So in order to understand more about what's going on, we, let's see, as we've done in the past, we measure XMCD images from many different orientations in order to use this angular information to understand what's going on. So we first of all look at the zero degrees um, image that we saw in the previous slide, and then rotate the sample at many different orientations. And we, we're looking specifically at this region of the um, image, which is indicated by these, um, these black stars, which indicates the position of our um, chirality threshold. Now, when we look at this contrast, it's actually reminiscent of a very well-known magnetic structure. That is the magnetic vortex. And this is for, um, for the following reason. 
when we look, for example, at zero degrees, we see that we have this bright spot, so this blue spot, that is surrounded by the opposite contrast. Now, this is very reminiscent of the um, co contrast expected from a, the out-of-plane contrast of a magnetic core of a, of a domain one. Now, when we rotate the sample at 60 degrees, or if we rotate the sample and specifically at 60 degrees, we see that this contrast changes to, let's say, bright on the top and uh, dark on the bottom. Again, mirroring the contrast that is known to um, result from a magnetic vortex. And indeed, when we perform micromagnetic simulations, we see that due to the um, meeting of these two chiralities, a topological defect, so a vortex, actually does form. Um, showing again kind of the, the power that this um, new 3D printing technique gives us. So now onto the very last um, point of my talk, which is going to 3D spintronics, or let's say taking the first steps towards going to 3D spintronic devices. And this is again the work of Fan Fan Meng um, at the University of Cambridge. So when we think about 3D spintronics, I just want to have a quick reminder of why these are interesting. And we can remind ourselves of going back to the start of my talk, where we were talking about the racetrack memory proposed by Stuart Parkin. Now we know with this 3D architecture, we can have very, we have the possibility to achieve very high memory densities. We also know that um, theory has predicted um, that in these straight sections of these cylindrical nanowires or nanotubes, we can get very fast information transfer, so very fast domain wall motion. And we know that first experimental studies um, have confirmed these promising domain wall mobilities and velocities. Now the next question is, what happens when the structure is no longer, let's say, straight in three dimensions, but when we have these three dimensional, more complicated 3D configurations? And this is what we are trying to answer in the work with uh, FANFA. So the structure that we've been looking at is a cobalt nano bridge. So again, patterned with FEBID, we're using um, Luca's program um, with the 3D printing, where you can see that we're able to really integrate this 3D structure, this 3D magnetic structure, into a 2D um, microelectronic structure uh, circuit. Now we can notice a few things about this structure. So first of all, we're really able to bring the magnetic material in a controlled way into the third dimension. This is the first step towards going to 3D. We're also able to um, design the structure such that we have a relatively um, efficient, in terms of space, four-point probe measurement system, which allows us to characterize the magnetic properties of this structure. And uh, you can see in this um, SEM image that we are able to realize the structure with a high degree of accuracy with FEBIT. Now, in order to understand the magnetotransport in 3D, similar to our X-ray measurements, we need to measure the properties from many different orientations. And this is what we do. We combine the angular dependent measurements of the magnetotransport by applying magnetic fields for many different orientations with respect to the 3D structure with finite element and macro spin simulations that um, aim to simulate the magnetoresistance of our bridge. And in this way, we're able to characterize the magnetoelectrical properties and um, let's say, identify the influence of the 3D structure on these uh, on the magneto resistance. And um, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but one specific um, point that I want to focus on is a quite, let's say, unexpected, or now that we know it's not unexpected, but was, was quite an unexpected finding that we discovered. And that was um, when we looked at the even signal of our magneto resistance, and this is applied at four Tesla. So when we look at the even signal, and this is as a function of angle, um, we see a quite an unusual angular dependence with a peak in the resistance at um, th about 30 degrees. Now, when we're looking at the even signal, so this is the part of the signal that corresponds mainly to the AMR, so the anisotropic magnetoresistance. resistance. However, when we um, simulated the AMR, we saw a very different um, angular dependence. And what we realized is that in order to understand and actually reproduce our structures, we needed to take account of the mag magnon magneto resistance. So a quick um, reminder of what the magnon magneto resistance is. The idea is that we have magnons in our um, material, so in our magnetic material, that result in um, scattering from the electrons. Now, when we apply a large magnetic field, we can suppress the magnons, we can suppress the precession of the electrons, of, of the spin, and lower the resistivity of our material. And um, now you may think, 
in a 3D structure. Okay, we're applying the same four Teslas at different directions, but it turns out that the 3D structure has a very strong influence on the magnetomagneto resistance because of the demagnetizing field, so the magnetostatic um, energy of our structures. Specifically, when we look at the DMAG field of our structures, because we have these non-collinear um, regions of, of, the, of the bridge, we have a strong influence on the, um, on the resulting effective field, so the total magnetic field that is felt by the magnons, um, that needs to be the total magnetic induction. And indeed, when we simulate this, or we incorporate this model, into our simulations. We see the opposite, um, let's say, angular dependence of the MMR to the EMR, which allows us to reproduce this angular dependence of our 3D structure. Meaning that okay, the takeaway message is that we have this magnon magneto resistance that in 3D structures can lead to a very strong angular dependence. And this is due again to the, the influence of magnetostatics in 3D, almost reminiscent of our work with the vortex rings. So with this new, let's see, with FEBIT, we have this new nano prototyping method, which allows us to characterize these systems and let's say, get new insights into the physics of 3D magnetoelectrical uh, geometries. And I want to emphasize that with this 3D printing technique, this is actually extendable to a wide variety of geometries. So it'll be really important for future um, studies going towards, let's say one day, 3D spintronics. So with that, uh, this takes me to the last, um, or to my conclusions, where I've, in this talk, I've spoken to you about um, two main regions or types of magnetic, uh, 3D magnetic systems. First of all, in the bulk with magnetic, um, the development of 3D imaging techniques, which have allowed to, us to visualize block points and magnetic vortex rings, the implementation of laminography in both the hard and the soft soft x-ray regime, allowing for bulk and nanostructure systems to be visualized. And again, the mapping of magnetization dynamics in 3D. And in the patterned mat magnetic material side of things, with this new 3D printing technique, we can realize chiromagnetic nanostructures and make the first steps towards 3D spintronics. And as you can imagine, there's a lot of excitement going forward. So we're very look much looking forward to making use of the next generation of synchrotrons to push the spatial resolution of these imaging techniques. This will allow us to look more closely into the statics and dynamics of 3D magnetic systems and the same hopefully be able to look for topologically non-trivial 3D structures. Now in the very last um, second, I just want to mention that next year I'll be starting uh, my own group in Dresden and MPI. So if anyone's interested in PhD positions or postdocs in 3D magnetism, please feel free to get in touch. So thanks again, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Claire, for your very interesting and wonderful talk. Do we have questions? So I'm just, um, yeah, so Ross? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay, so on um, slide 12, you spoke about uh, using the magnetic vorticity to um, kind of find these uh, topological magnetic structures. What I wanted to ask was just, um, can this um, vorticity here be identified as any kind of topological invariant, or is it more just an aid to find uh, such configurations within your data? So yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so as I mentioned, the magnetovorticity, if we think about, um, our, let's say, the calculation of the Skirmian number density, if we think about what's inside the, the integral, um, that is essentially a component of the magnetic vorticity vector. So it is really directly related or directly related to these um, topological, let's say, values. Um, it's not an invariant as such in itself. However, if you imagine, let's say, in the sense that the flux of the Skirmian number density is not an invariant, but the Skirmian number is an invariant. So likewise, if you could integrate over this vorticity vector, you could um, determine the Skirmian number of your structures. Yeah. Does that help? Please. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. So the next question is from Alexis. Alexis. Yes. Uh, hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, thank you, Claire, for the very nice talk. I had a question related to the same part of your presentation. Uh, actually, just one slide ahead when you, uh, exactly when you can see where the block points are. First of all, it's a, 
it's a very nice idea and uh, it works apparently very well. Uh, out of curiosity, uh, have you made, uh, let's say, statistics on the um, polarities of block points? Do you get more or less half and half of uh, block points and anti-block points or is it a bit more biased? So um, actually, it's a really good point. Um, we get, especially well, in this data set, we looked at a few different samples. In this data set, we get surprisingly almost um, an equal amount of positive and negative, so block points and anti-block points, which kind of um, goes with our feeling that these are likely to have formed you know, within the bulk uh, during the formation of the magnetic configuration. In, the, in some other samples, we saw perhaps a slight difference from exactly 50%, but it was all, always roughly 50%. Yeah. Okay, and you, you said there were about 50 of them, for instance, in this particular example? Or... Yep. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. We count them one by one. Yeah. Well, very nice. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Do we have further questions? As we have another one from Stavros. Yeah, hello. Uh, I, you mentioned that uh, the vortex rings are, the, I mean, the configurations that you show are static and including vortex rings. I would like to know how much this is due to pinning probably of the material to defects or I, I don't know, I mean, I mean, lattice defects or something, or is it a genuine dynamical result that they have to be static or, or something? Yeah, so that's, that's also a really, really good question. So we, um, this is obviously something we were looking for. And um, we know that our sample is polycrystalline. So um, there are likely going to be grain boundaries and some pinning defects present. So one of the tests that we did was we applied um, a number of uh, field protocols. So we saturated the sample and then looked at the remnant configuration after saturation. And we also um, applied, let's say, a, a thermal field protocol where we raised the sample up to about 400. Um, Kelvin and again applied the saturating field. Now the interesting thing was that we saw um, different magnetic configurations and different vortex rings appearing after these um, after these field protocols, which indicated that they weren't purely um, due to pinning sites. However, what we think might be going on is that there might be some relation. So we observed that the vortex rings often occur in the vicinity of block points. And it's likely that block points may be pinned themselves. So it may be a kind of indirect pinning. Um, but we're still looking into this in more detail to try and understand exactly what's going on. OK, thank you. Yeah. Next question is from Ashley Cook. Um, could you please talk? OK, hi. Um, yeah, I was just wondering about the possibility of uh, distinguishing between orbital and spin contributions. Uh, to the magnetic order, can you? Is it possible to visualize those individually? Oh, so that um, that's that's a really good question. I haven't. I mean, we've not been thinking about that. We've mainly been just looking at the vectorial component. I guess in order to do that, you would have to perform spectroscopic um, spectroscopic tomography um, in order to you know let's say measure across the across the absorption edge and to identify the different co contributions of orbital and spin. In theory, I, I, so first answer, I'm not sure, but I think I imagine it would be possible. Uh, the main challenge is going to be the length of the measurement that would be required. So these, these um, measurements already take a very long time and they're just about possible within the, let's say a standard beam time. Now what might, what will become, um, or what will be a real game changer when it comes to the upgrade of the current synchrotron radiations is that we'll be able to do these measurements a lot faster and potentially um, go down those kind of routes. So it might be something to think of uh, in a few years time, definitely. We have another question from Gisela Schütz. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I have a question concerning what you can learn or how to interpret your data. If you look at these pillars consisting of gadolinium, cobalt, and so on, uh, if you compare this with theory, you have to do some micromagnetic simulations or an analytical results. The fact is that even in 2D, especially these for F3D systems are extremely sensitive concerning all important magnetic parameters magnetization, exchange, 
and so on, on uh, the local magnetic performance, which you cannot control uh, re really a perfect, or you cannot control, you see this also in the bulk systems. Uh, it is very hard to get uh, an equal 4D3, uh, 4F 3D component. Uh, can this problem be solved? Because if you compare your results with micromagnetic simulations, you a priori don't know the local variation of the magnetic parameters, especially in your um, low dimensional system. This is yeah. worse for 2D, but it's even worse for 3D, where you have these extremely awful magnetostatics. Yeah. So, um, yeah, thank you. That's a really good point. Um, so in terms of the, so we ha almost have another, let's say, added uh, challenge when it comes to 3D in that, so I, I guess I showed the example when we're looking at uh, some micromagnetic simulations. We, um, one of our collaborators had performed um, some calculations to determine the exchange length and that's what we use. So we model it essentially as a, um, as a kind of soft ferromagnet. We don't take the full, you know, ferromagnetic um, structure, so behavior into account. Uh, but when we go to 3D structures, uh, what I maybe didn't mention is that we were looking, anyway, we were only able to look at a much smaller system than what we actually measure in the experiment because these are such huge, um, such huge meshes and a huge amount of time would be needed in order to simulate them. Mm -hmm. So I think um, what we've seen so far is that we don't, so we, we essentially, are not, we haven't gone into too much detail and not too much thought about exactly the type of our material. We're kind of treating it as um, essentially, or understanding it or interpreting it as a um, as a, a ferromagnet instead of the ferry magnet that it is. But I think this is a valid approx yeah, sort of approximation when it comes to interpreting the magnetic configuration. I don't think even if we were dealing with transition metals, I'm not sure we could ever um, really reproduce our our data with um, micromagnetic simulation just because of the sheer size of these of these systems mm -hmm. but it's something that will definitely be um yeah going into more detail in, in the future okay thank you thank you and we also have a few questions in the chat sebastian diaz can you please ask your question Hi, uh, very nice talk. So my question is about the algorithm that you're using for the reconstruction of the magnetic texture. What would be potential pitfalls of this algorithm? So there's one very, so um, just to go into a little bit more detail, for, uh, essentially what the algorithm is, uh, so, so it's a gradient-based iterative reconstruction algorithm. We don't assume any particular magnetic, med magnetic structure. We actually start with an initial guess, which is zero. So this um, really means that um, we have a surprisingly accurate reconstruction with um, based on this on these kind of XMCD projections. Now, the major limitation of XMCD 3D imaging is that we are not sensitive to highly, or let's see, we struggle with highly divergent structures in that we cannot um, reconstruct divergent, purely divergent configurations. And the way that we can understand that is if we have a hedgehog structure, we have, let's say, compensating spins from all directions. The total XMCD contrast of that is always going to be zero, whether or not we have them pointing in or pointing out. Now, for these length scales, if what, we're relatively lucky in a sense because these length scales, or no, this limitation, translates to a slight lowering of the magnitude of the magnetization in the vicinity of um, in the vicinity of these divergent structures. But in fact, we're still able to recover or reconstruct the direction to a very, so very accurately. So in a sense, it's quite, um, we're, we're quite lucky in that sense, but that is something that we're thinking now about um, alternative types of measurement that we could get around that. So. Thank you. Thanks. There's another question in the chat from an anonymous attendee. So let me just read it. Thanks for the very nice talk and beautiful works. Question one, can this technique be applied to anti-ferromagnets, for example, using XMLD? And question two, how long does it take to collect one data set? Okay, so I guess question two is the easier, um, is, is a sort of quicker answer. So for these tomographic um, measurements of, the, of these pillars, it takes about 50 hours to measure one sample. With the laminography, it's, it's essentially uh, sort of related to the volume that you're looking at. The laminography, we're looking at a smaller volume. It took about 14 hours for one, um, let's say, static measurement. Now, um, when we go to higher 
let's say higher fluxes, we'll be able to bring this down really by orders of magnitude, which will be really a game changer for what we can do. Now, in terms of the antiferromagnetic um, case, this is actually something that I'm working on in the moment. So we have a, a student, um, we're working on developing the algorithm for antiferromagnetic anti 3D imaging. And um, it looks very promising so far. We're, we're just really at the start of this project, but it might be that in the future we'll be able to do the same kind of imaging for antiferromagnetic systems. Thank you very much. Um, I don't see any more questions. So thank you, Claire, again for this wonderful talk and for the answers. And then we will see each other next week. Thank you. Thank you very much again for the invitation. And um. Thanks, Karina, and thanks to Jairo as well for, for this. It was really great. Um, good yeah, speak to you later. Bye-bye.